We talked about muscle tissue as part of the histology section, and we looked at skeletal muscle tissue, smooth muscle tissue, and cardiac muscle tissue. Now it's time to take the tissue and take it a step further to looking at the muscular system and what the muscular system does for us. The functions of the muscular system can be divided into three main activities. The first and the most obvious is movement. Our muscles are responsible for most of the movement that occurs in our bodies. Skeletal muscle moves our bones or moves structures that aren't bones, such as the tongue or the eyelids. Muscles help to move air in and out of the body. The diaphragm does that. The cardiac muscle moves blood around the body. And muscles in the digestive and urinary tracts help to move food and waste through the body. The muscular system is also important for stability or preventing movement. We have sphincters of smooth muscle that prevent wastes from exiting the body when we're not ready for that. And we have muscles that help maintain our posture so that we can remain upright and still when performing other activities. And muscles are important for holding joints still when we don't want them to move. And finally, the muscular system plays a really important role in the regulation of body temperature. And that's because your muscles are responsible for generating most of your body's heat. Up to 85% of your heat production comes from the skeletal muscles. So that's clearly a really important contribution to regulating body temperature. Whether we're talking about cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, or skeletal muscle, all muscle tissues share four important properties. The first one we've talked about before, and that is that muscle tissue is excitable. Remember that a tissue that excites, remember that to be excitable means that the cells will change their membrane potential in response to some sort of signal. The membrane potential is the difference between the charge inside the cell and the charge outside the cell based on the different concentrations of ions. And excitable cells receive signals and change their membrane potential. They change the charge of the cell in response to that signal. And that's what muscle cells do. Another important property of muscle tissue is that it is contractile. That means that muscle cells get shorter, and as they get shorter, it produces force. This is the property that actually allows the muscles to carry out their functions of movement and stability, is the ability to contract and produce force. The third property is that muscle tissue is extensible. That means it can be stretched. We can stretch muscle tissue. Related to that is the property of elasticity. Once we stretch the muscle tissue, it recoils back to its original length. That property of returning to the original length once it's been stretched is elasticity. So we can stretch it, but it goes back to its normal shape again. While we will talk a little bit about smooth muscle and cardiac muscle, most of our focus in this unit is going to be on the skeletal muscle. And let's take a closer look at skeletal muscle anatomy. Recall that skeletal muscle cells are called muscle fibers. So one skeletal muscle cell is a muscle fiber. And this is a long cell. It can be up to 30 centimeters long. And think about the cases of some of the long muscles in your thighs. The cells stretch the whole length of the muscle and that's going to be a pretty long cell. And these cells also are multinucleated, meaning they have more than one nucleus in them. This is a side effect of how they develop. Skeletal muscle fibers develop originally as a series of myocytes, individual muscle cells, that then fuse together into one long cell that then contains many nuclei. Each individual muscle fiber is surrounded by a layer of areolar connective tissue called the endomysium. The endomysium, or this thin layer around each individual muscle cell, is important because it contains the capillaries and the neurons that are needed for that muscle fiber to function. But a single muscle fiber doesn't function alone. Bundles of muscle fibers work together. A bundle of muscle fibers is called a muscle fascicle. Each fascicle is surrounded by a layer of connective tissue called a paramysium. And this contains the nerves and blood vessels that are going to eventually provide the signals and nutrients to the cells within that muscle fascicle. 
We're actually used to seeing muscle fascicles. When you look at a piece of meat and you see the grain of the meat, you can see the direction the fibers are running, what you're actually seeing are muscle fascicles. Nearly every muscle drawing or muscle model shows little lines indicating the direction of the muscles. These are representing the muscle fascicles or the bundles of muscle fibers. We bundle these muscle fascicles together to make an actual muscle. The muscle has a layer of connective tissue around it as well. The layer of connective tissue around the muscle is called the epimysium. The epimysium is important not only to hold the muscle together, but also to connect the muscle to its attachments. In some cases, we have direct attachment of a muscle to a bone. So the epimysium around the muscle merges directly into the periosteum of the bone. That's what's going to hold the muscle to the bone. In the case of an indirect attachment, the epimysium of the muscle rearranges into the dense regular connective tissue of a tendon, and the tendon then merges into the periosteum of the bone. While I'll most often talk about muscles attaching to bones, muscles can also attach to other structures. Sometimes we see attachment of muscles to other muscles, or we can see the attachment of muscles to the dermis of the skin, especially when we're looking at muscles that are going to be moving parts of the skin. We can see the attachment of muscles to broad tendons called aponeuroses or other sorts of structures. In some cases, we see groups of muscles bundled together, and these are going to be surrounded by a layer of connective tissue called the deep fascia. For example, the muscles of the anterior thigh are bundled together with deep fascia, as are the muscles of the posterior thigh. Finally, over these muscles or groups of muscles, we have the hypodermis. Recall that the hypodermis is a layer of loose connective tissue that connects the dermis of the skin to the underlying muscle.